So now I'd like to introduce our next topic, which is actually your topic. As I said, just as we did last year, we polled everybody to ask, what did you want to talk about at this meeting? And I have to tell you, it was unbelievably overwhelming what the topic was, and it was around virtual health. And while that's an extension of one of the breakout groups we have from one of the interests last year, I think it's just perfect and timely, and the world is just changing so quickly. So we're going to talk about the future of virtual health. It's timely, it's right for us, particularly as we think about the rebuild of Providence Healthcare and St. Paul's. But I'd also like to hand the podium over to Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. Dr. Rabinowitz is a cardiologist. He's president of the medical staff at St. Paul's Hospital here in Vancouver, and is a clinical associate professor in the Division of Cardiology at the University of British Columbia. And I would say, after having known Alan now for a couple years, really a visionary thinker, and he's able to really take a set of dots and pull those together. And we're really excited about that. Dr. Rabinowitz is going to go ahead uh, and really brings a great deal of interest and passion in this area. He was a speaker at last year's forum and will be actually the uh, host for one, of the break, or for one of the three breakout sessions this afternoon. But Alan has a panel he's put together. This is going to be exciting. So Alan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much uh, for the kind of introduction, Bob. It's, uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here, particularly an honor to be part of this uh, fantastic organization and also to be the president of a medical staff with such talent and such, and such uh, great collective aspiration. Um, it's also my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome um, Brendan Byrne, who will provide, um, a, uh, provide comments at the start of this, uh, of, of this panel. Um, Brendan, um, as everyone knows here, is the newly minted Chief Innovation Officer for TELUS Health. Um, he's based in Vancouver, which presents an enormous opportunity for um, the life sciences community um, uh, in BC and, of course, the rest of Canada and, and, and beyond that. Um, Brendan um, has a degree in neurobiology from Yale University and is a medical graduate of McGill University. He's still a practicing family physician, but, Bre but Brendan really um, rose to eminence, um, um, having founded uh, Wolf um, Electronic Medical Systems in 1998 and, and grew it to uh, one of the largest EMR companies in Canada. Um, he, uh, it was eventually acquired by, by TELUS um, and uh, Brendan um, is now in the role of Chief Innovation Officer um, uh, in TELUS and uh, the unique opportunity that Brendan presents isn't only because of his smarts and insights but also because of the unique ability that he has to integrate deep knowledge of a healthcare, healthcare practice with technology um, and, uh, and industry. So Brendan, welcome, we look forward to your comments. Uh, thanks, Alan. So uh, this is a, a topic that uh, I think uh, the, the, the title says it all, the future is now, it's something that we, we have to do. Um, my, my talk's gonna be kind of easy though because I think Anton's comment, uh, the impassioned comments from somebody practicing uh, you know, on the front lines in the north uh, really really sums it up. It is something that we have to do. So I'm going to have fairly high level comments so that we can have lots of time in the panel. Um, so the first thing I just want to say is, you know, virtual care is, is, is actually really better care. Uh, and at some point I, I hope that the standard of care is not to recall people with COPD for routine visits in the middle of January to sit in our waiting rooms for an average of 40 minutes while people are sneezing around them. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So uh, there are many examples of, of how you can do uh, better care virtually than you can by dragging people into, into our offices. Um, improved access. So you know, this is a horror story for Canada. We're, you know, in, in a Commonwealth study of 11 OECD countries, uh, we're, we're last. We're absolutely last for same or next day appointments. Uh, this is something that can be addressed with virtual care. We also are first in the use of emergency departments after hours uh, and, and on weekends. So improved access. More efficient. So you know, when you look at virtual care uh, and you look at organizations that have embraced virtual care like Kaiser Permanente, uh, up to 50% of their visits are being delivered virtually. So, so that's email, it's video conference, it's telephone, it's kind of, it's, it's just turn, turning around and saying, you know what, if, if we believe in patient-centered care, then perhaps dragging patients to our offices and our facilities and making them wait doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and I think all of us have had that experience of, uh, of 
you know, a, a medical encounter where, frankly, it was more about the practitioner or the institution schedule than it was uh, anything to do with ours. But it's also more efficient on other bases, and, and uh, you know, you, you notice just on, on, on the image, um, you know, with virtual care, you can bring in a number of different parties at the same time. So you can have specialists and primary care. So when you're, you know, thinking about the panel this morning, you know, you really could have specialists, primary care, you could have researchers involved. Um, you could get a lot of people involved, and the, the medical home actually can be delivered virtually, um, which is something that's actually pretty hard to do uh, you know, and coordinate. I remember, you know, during my years at Royal Columbian, trying to coordinate the multidisciplinary team meetings uh, and just getting everybody there on time was probably the biggest difficulty. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we've touched on, 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 on three things that sound an awful lot like the triple aim, um, but I don't want to just leave it there in terms of why we should do virtual care. The other thing to realize is, is virtual care is, begins to be a platform. Uh, and a platform to extend capabilities. So, you know, Anton touched on a couple of you know, areas with COPD and CHF where, frankly, you know, home health monitoring uh, can keep patients out of emergency, keep patients from being readmitted. Um, and these can be integrated, you know, with the, the virtual care environment. Um, we also are getting into an age where, you know, I just spent uh, some time in San Diego at the Exponential Medicine Conference where you know, there's an explosion of technology coming to us, uh, especially in sensors. Um, and some of those sensors can be very good in terms of understanding what's happening in a home, especially for the frail elderly. Uh, you know, 1% of our population that's in the frail elderly category represents 21% of our healthcare spend. Um, so doing more around predictive analytics in that 1%, tying it to virtual care uh, is something that we really could uh, you know, get a lot of benefit from very quickly. Uh, and the final thing I'll kind of close off on is, you know, virtual care is really patient-centered. Um, and, and, and the interesting part with this is um, it gives the patient a platform to use. So, um, th you know, through, through their devices, through their, through their computer, uh, they now have access. They can have access to their records in a way that's quite different. Um, and with the St. Paul's rebuild and, and what's going on in this community, I would urge you to think about this being the time to reinvent healthcare delivery uh, by truly putting the patient at the center. Uh, and I think you can do that by actually embracing virtual care and you know, giving them something that they, they, they can hang on to and look at uh, and become part of the care. So thank you all. Thanks very much, Brennan. So if the, um, if the future is now, then the opportunity is right here. It's in this room, it's uh, in this institution right across the street. Um, and the, the aim of this conference, following on from last year's conference, is not to have another conversation. Um, it's really to do something. Um, and this is a, an opportunity to get together while doing the work in between. So some work was done between last year and this year, and I believe that a lot more work is going to be, be done between this session and, and next year's session. Um, just to frame the, um, the, uh, the conversation, can I have my first uh, slide, please? Um, because um, constructs are very helpful. So the triple aim is a helpful construct. construct. The notion of a, an academic health science concept is a very helpful construct. What many of us increasingly are finding particularly helpful to frame all the, the things that we like to see put together um, within these conversations um, is embodied within the the vision statement by the Institute of Medicine. And if you listen to the words carefully, it really resonates on so many levels. Our vision is for the development of a continuously learning health system in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation, with best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process, patients and families active participants in all elements, and new knowledge captured as an integral byproduct of the care experience. So it really talks to, about Modern day, the, the capabilities of modern-day systems in iterating rather than having to revisit um, uh, on an ad hoc basis the, the problems that we encounter. Um, conveniently, we've heard um, from uh, Neil Fraser um, in depth about the, um, the advisory panel on healthcare innovation, which um, gripped all of our attention a few months ago. 
we've, we've gotten to understand why we began to hear less about it after that initial um, excitement, and we're all hoping that this is going to be very impactful on, on our collective environment. Um, but just from a personal note, um, as a South African who um, immigrated here as well around 20 years ago, Canada at the time was one of the top systems in the world. It has all the ingredients to, to jump forward and to leapfrog um, to being the top system in the world. The question is how we managed to have it leapfrog. And having it leapfrog means leveraging not only the assets but removing the obstacles. I think a, a part of the very important conversation that we need to have in this room is how to remove those obstacles to really get to value. And I showed a couple of these next slides um, um, at the session last year, and I'm showing them again for the purposes of continuity. But I believe, and people here will accuse me of being professional, a professional optimist, which of course is true, but I believe that we have a perfect storm right here in, in, in BEC at the moment for a variety of reasons. It's related to the, um, the, the sense of urgency recognized at the level of the provincial government. It's related to the opportunity um, around the rebuild of St. Paul's. And, and that presents an opportunity not only for St. Paul's, not at all only for St. Paul's, but for, for everyone in BC. And it's gratifying to see Mary Ackenhausen in the, in the audience. Uh, I'm not sure if Mary's still here. Maybe she left before my talk. Hi, Mary. <laughs> um, Ryan Darcy from uh, Innovation Boulevard, Surrey. And if one look, considers the critical mass in this environment, this isn't an opportunity for an institution only. It's a regional play, and, and in order to play seriously, it has to play as a region in order, to, in order to be able to compete with other regions elsewhere in the world that are looking to do exactly the same thing, perhaps not necessarily with the same degree of opportunity, if one considers all the elements. Um, and of course, it's also an opportunity because of the, the sense of urgency recognized at the federal level. And the question then, of course, is how to bring that opportunity um, and that recognition to the local environment. And this is the, um, the famous slide, uh, the famous painting by Tico Kerr, uh, or in Granville terminology, the mud hut um, of, of St. Paul's Hospital. Um, and uh, as we pointed out last year, this, um, this is a, an institution that might look to be very short of breath at the time. Certainly that was true. It has been resuscitated. And it's an institution bursting with creative energy. Part of the way in which it has to be able to contain itself is by expanding in a virtual way outside until the new building is built. But the value proposition is not the building. The value proposition is harnessing all the elements of value which reside within the institution. And obviously, virtual medicine is a perfect way of doing that. And in the interests of getting to value, I don't think that we actually have to, um, to have many more conversations about this. Um, as we look to embody the vision of the Learning Health Organization, Bob Sindelar has beautifully put together this construct around the rebuild of Providence Healthcare. Um, and Keith Waddy referred to it. This is only part of the value proposition, of course, but it is a very useful organizing framework to collect the, the value proposition. And if the currency of value is data, then at the center of that value proposition is some kind of framework to leverage the data that's created either within the institution or by virtue of the virtualization of the institution. And so um, it's the, the notion of the Providence Healthcare Research Institute's PhD High Capacity Computation Hub uniting great minds and big data to enhance and integrate care research and training to support a campus of care. Um, and factored into that opportunity um, is the opportunity to link phenotypic data with all types of other data, whatever omic data provides the value proposition in terms of the healthy aging or personalized medicine or precision medicine. So with those um, introductory comments, I'd like to welcome up the panel. Um, Brendan Byrne, I've already introduced. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce the second panelist, um, the um, newly minted Dean of Medicine at UBC, Dr. Dermot Kelleher. Dermot, please uh, come up. Uh, Dr. Kelleher comes to us um, from um, University from Imperial College in, in London, having been the Dean there. And it's really a pleasure to be able to, um, to leverage the insights and vast experience of Dr. Kelleher in this particular space um, at the time of this panel, because um, Dermot has experience not only in, in academic science, but also in the field of, of uh, commercialization, innovation, and within a clinical and research career, was able to couple um, uh, interventional um, endoscopy in, the, in gastroenterology with a research career in immunology, which itself is absolutely unique. Second panelist, Shauna Turner. Um, Shauna has also um, um, joined, uh, uh, joined Providence Healthcare only within the last month or two. 
Um, and it's also an absolute, an absolute pleasure to be able to welcome you, Shauna, as the Chief Innovation Officer at PHC and the Executive Vice Pre uh, President of Research, Providence Healthcare Research Institute. Um, Shauna has a background in digital health um, in the private sector in both the US and in Canada, and vast experience as well in the public sector in British Columbia, which again presents unique and specific opportunity. The third panelist you've really heard from this morning, Dr. Anton Mayer, a, um, a countryman of mine, but I promise you will speak English and not Afrikaans this morning, Anton. Um, uh, Anton um, has vast experience in the, in the, in the rural space in um, South Africa, um, and then as well in, in Ontario and Manitoba prior to coming to, coming to, um, to Fort St. James over the last three years where he's um, created huge system improvements within the local domain and as a result of those um, initiatives um, was voted the BC Family Doctor of the Year this year and received his award within the last two weeks. And then the um, next panelist is um, Liz uh, Dickinson. Um, Liz is um, not, uni a not unique, but a very, very um, special example um, of a successful homegrown entrepreneur. Um, Liz is the CEO and founder uh, of Mio Global, which as many in the audience will know, has developed the Mio Alpha app, which is the first um, um, uh, high performance um, heart rate monitor, which does not require um, a um, a band, um, and, um, and has made huge impact on the world stage um, with um, the, the health and wellness community and as well with investors and, uh, and analysts. And um, then last but by no means least um, is Anne-Marie, um, the irrepressible Anne-Marie Kahn. Um, Anne-Marie is a star um, um, nurse leader in the um, Heart Center at St. Paul's Hospital. She is a clinical nurse specialist in the era of heart failure and, uh, and transplant. And her role bridges um, uh, providing um, education around, around new paradigms in healthcare related, not only to heart, but, but more broadly. Um, uh, also includes the role of educator, um, research advisor, and importantly, a lead uh, in multidisciplinary um, uh, delivery of care. So Anne-Marie has had a role which spans the acute and the, hype and the, and the very sick within the, uh, the ICU kind of framework the post-transplant framework, or the, the VAD, ventricular assist device framework, but as well has developed um, applications itself for de delivery of, um, of virtual care to heart failure patients throughout the province. So Amory, pleasure to have you on the panel as well. Um, the way I'd like to do this, I think, is start off by asking each panelist a question um, and then open it up to the audience. Um, um, we only have uh, about 30 minutes in total, but this is part of a continuum as well because um, this session will be followed by two breakout sessions, which I'd encourage you um, to attend, of course, not at the expense of the other panels, um, but to, to ask questions and make contributions, um, both during the course of this panel um, discussion and, and as well the breakout sessions, because at the end of it, we'll have a report back um, and uh, an summation session. And again, I'd remind the audience that the idea isn't to have a discussion. The, audience, the idea is to consider how to make the future now and how to make the opportunity here. Um, so, Anne perhaps I can start off with you. Um, um, in the what I call the, Na the, the Naylor Fraser report, um, <laughs> w w one of the um, one, one of the problems that was um, um, highlighted, or one of the opportunities highlighted, was the op was the um, the need to, um, to to make the the focus of healthcare more more, more uh, patient specific. And in the process of that, um, both engage and empower the patient. From your experience and in your view, what is the unique opportunity presented by a virtual medicine environment in order to achieve that goal? Um, well, uh, thanks, Alan. The first thing I think of is uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I ran into one of our heart failure patients from Prince George, who's 85 years old, who uh, got on the Northern Health bus, came all the way down to Vancouver, um, sat for an hour in the waiting room, to be seen by one of our cardiologists for 15 minutes. Um, stayed overnight in a hotel, got back on the northern bus and went home. And uh, so for me, one of the big opportunities is how can we provide this guy specialist care in an appropriate environment? Uh, we've worked a lot on creating uh, specialist clinics in some of the regional centers, but certainly uh, many, many, in fact, most patients 
don't have access to that. So in my mind, uh, using every telehealth technology possible, and that's not only the high-tech, high-cost stuff, using the telephone, using smartphones um, uh, is huge. And in fact, when I started in the heart function clinic uh, 15 years ago here in Canada, uh, not probably less than 30% of patients had access to a cell phone. We recently surveyed patients and most of our patients are now using smartphone technology and the average age of our patients is 75. So, you know, in my mind, rather than spending big bucks on implementing huge digital systems, we've, most of us have got one in our hand. So how can we use this to reach our patients at home? That's my big thing. Thanks, Emery. We don't need to spend a lot of money, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, moving on to you, Liz. Um, David Nader is also on record of saying that if the ethos in the US is largely about lust and greed, um, then the ethos in Canada, in some, in some respects, embodies fear and envy. Um, now, I, I don't think it's necessarily true because I think, that's, I think that, there's, that there's a vast crossover in, in both directions between Canada and the US. But Liz, as a, as a, as a very successful entrepreneur who's able to, um, to both experience and be successful in the US markets, um, you've very successfully taken um, a product to, to market within the, the area of, of, uh, of health and wellness. What, what do you see in your experience as the differences um, um, in, between the US and Canada which might enable successful entrepreneurs like yourself? It's an interesting question because there's always this feeling in Canada that we don't want to buy Canadian. And I, I don't really understand that phenomenon, but <clears throat> it is the truth. And I really started my company in the US specifically because I felt that that market was more receptive to what we were doing than the Canadian market, not to mention there's, of course, 10 times more people, but it was uh, certainly an, um, an easier task to um, get awareness of our product. But I think what's really interesting in that market is how uh, keenly interested they are in how sensor technologies can change the way that they engage with their patients. Like, there is so much work being done right now. This is a PPG sensor, which everybody would be familiar, familiar with. But from this simple low-cost device, not only can I get heart rate, but I can get heart rate variability, which is one of the best uh, non-invasive predictors of health, of uh, stress levels. I can get um, COPD. I can look at um, PVC. I can diagnose sleep apnea because we can do respiration. We can do oxygenation, all from lights passing through tissue and at price points at under $100. So what I'm thinking is that there's going to be a huge revolution in disseminating these kinds of sensor technologies and then big data analysis and South Africa is doing amazing things with big physiological databases and creating predictive analytics um, around helping patients understand what that data means and how they should respond to it and managing their own health outcomes. And I think that that will eventually trans find its way up to Canada, but it'll happen in the States first. I just want to pick up on that, on that last comment, uh, because I met Anton actually through my work with the, the Rural Doctors Organization in British Columbia. And, um, and there are unique um, um, opportunities which are presented by the, by the similarities between South Africa um, and, and Canada, rural Canada. And I'll point out that about 42% of rural doctors, rural GPs in, in British Columbia are in fact South African. So we put in together these exchange programs, which is something that's, that I personally would love to see fleshed out during discussion, because we can disrupt uh, the conservatism in, 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 in local environments by, by leveraging opportunities outside. And, and I think the people, the group that you're referring to, Liz, are at Discovery Health, um, presumably, in terms of the, the data usage. No, actually, it's LifeQ. Oh, oh LifeQ, okay, yeah. Which is a very another interesting story for sure. Um, but Anton, um, in, in your view, um, what, you've worked in both environments in South Africa and in Canada. What are the overlaps and what are the unique opportunities related to to, to First Nations, um, um, the First Nations environment, for example? And, and and how could you, as a rural doctor in a very nimble environment where you have control of your own data systems, you know, much you know, very flat kind of um, 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 health authority organisation. Um, how can and is it possible for rural doctors to lead the way uh, from the rural perspective rather than from the academic perspective? And one of the reasons I'm asking the question is because you made a very impassioned plea to the institution 
to, to focus on the, the end patient and just getting going. So rather than wait for us to get going, how do you guys get going? Or well, given that you've already gotten going, how do you lead the way? Thank you, Alan. Um, so the first time I worked uh, in Bikanjikam, I arrived on a plane, 4.15 in the afternoon, a community of 2,400 people in north, north, northwestern Ontario, uh, without running water. One of six communities in this country that brags about a $6 billion deficit or uh, access that we plow back into a rainy day fund, and 2,400 people up to today does not have running water. Uh, and so uh, that, that bothers me a lot. And as I entered the nursing station, I met Victoria. Victoria was 37 years old, had two children, and already two grandchildren. And she was burned from head to toe, more than 94% burn wounds. And so the struggle to go through that community and over a span of three years, see how her 13-year-old granddaughter uh, committed suicide, uh, the highest suicide under the age of 16 in the world in Bikanjikam. We talk about Canada. Uh, these things started bothering me a lot. And how can we bring better care in very difficult places to practice? And those are not only First Nation outreach communities. Uh, BC has got more than half of the 635 First Nation reserves in Canada. Uh, so we have the bulk of it. Uh, but there are many, many communities in the north, like Fort St. James, that did not have full scope, comprehensive, sustainable retention models of care. And it's the fragmentation and fragmented services, transient door mentality, we are there delivering a service on our way down to the south as we enter Canada. Or as we put new international medical grads in specific places or new residents that start off. So to change that, we need to change how we deliver care in primary care and how we support the quality physicians in the field on how to deliver their care, how to make not only the patient services accessible to the patient through a virtual world, but also access to services from a primary care practitioner side. What's available to me in that community? What can I rely on? Instead of sending patients to larger centers where they can receive better care. And we've all demonstrated that. So one of the difficulty Thing or difficult things I hear is when I hear what Anna Marie says, it's about this mobile reception tool that we have. And then I read correspondence from the college in the last month in an email that says, but regulations have not caught up. We cannot take a picture of a skin condition without a dermatologist available in the north of BC within a thousand miles. And I cannot send that to the dermatologist because what's going to happen? The future of medicine is personal health care, personal health records, integration of electronic medical records within this room. If you take Paul Terry and you take Bill Clifford and you put them in a room for one morning, not 10 months, they will design the platform to integrate electronic medical record uh, communication within one morning. I guarantee you that. <laughs> and why don't we do that? <laughs> so, <laughs> that boggles my mind. And then I sit here for the past uh, 15 years now in Canada, and I sit on tables like this, and I hear this conversation, and I hear it the next time, and I hear the passionate plea from Alan that says, let's not talk about what we talked about last year, so may I make a remark? We're going to talk about this next year again. I can give you a guarantee on that, because we do not have proper integration. So my solution is, let's establish 
and Officer of Innovation Chair in this province. Let's establish like some place that someone can coordinate or facilitate integration between regulatory, the colleges, academic. Why don't we teach in the academic complexes the tool sets, the principles on how to communicate safely, securely with uh, new virtual means, with the political playing field, to coordinate between all those facilities and institutions like this. That's the solution for me of the future. Create somewhere like your own innovation officer that you now have appointed, but that plays in the world of the province, that can take your brilliant programs that you're going to establish, that's already available in your own program, and make that accessible to everyone in the province in a scalable manner. Thanks, Anton. I invited you because I knew you'd make me feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the next panelist is, uh, is Shauna Turner. Shauna, um, you've had success in both the private sector and the public sector. How, how do organizations know um, where to start and, and know how to define their priorities if they want to proceed with, uh, with virtual medicine? How, how does this organization or any other organization know how to get going? Well, I think um, I've, had, I've had the privilege of uh, what I guess I would call 360 degrees of innovation. Um, in my experience, um, and I've worked in uh, the Canada, largely in the public sector in Canada and in the private sector in the U.S. So having, having that experience and being able to compare and contrast um, and really have the opportunity to put the government hat on and the government accountability um, as ADM uh, for innovation, I think about things very, very differently uh, than I once did um, because I've had to live in government shoes um, for a period of time. and. I think that what I would say to everybody sitting in the room, including uh, my former colleagues in government, is that we really need to think globally and collaboratively about the way that we're doing things. And if we're going to take the first steps, this sounds like, uh, this sounds like a motherhood statement, but it's incredibly important to think about. We really need to start uh, with the ending. What are we trying to achieve? You really need to define what it is that you want to achieve. If we think about virtual health, it sounds like this impossible giant thing and people think about shiny rooms and maybe video conferencing and those kinds of things. That absolutely is, is part of the solution. But the things that we've talked about here today so far, like translation and integration and making sure that the patient is at the center of the experience, those are all critical things to getting to your first step. So in terms of what I would recommend, I would recommend thinking about the things that are in the current context, not considering things, uh, not considering starting a project that is just going to be a pilot project. Again, think about it in terms of what you really want to achieve and then work back to the beginning. Think about putting your patient at the center. Think about context. What's the context for your patient? What's your context for your, for your clinical care uh, continuum? And, your physicians, all of the other clinicians that are going to be involved with that patient. So for example, this sounds, you know, I always say that innovation is probably, it's, it sounds like a really uh, powerful word that, that means everything and absolutely nothing. And I always say that innovation is kind of unsexy because it really is about understanding what the business processes are, what your regulatory environment is, how you're actually going to take a system view of things, and then how you translate that into the first step. So first step for organizations trying to engage, trying to get to market, or trying to get to government um, is, is really about understanding what kind of disruption needs to take place at, at the system level and how you can communicate that appropriately to your audience, whether that's government or a payer in the private sector. Right? We don't have models in Canada for private payers. We actually have to create entirely new business models in order to create a buyer for the things that, we, that we're doing here, right? And government has the very scary task of being the payer and the implementer of all of these things. And by the way, they're going to take accountability uh, for things, whether they go right or wrong. So we really need to think about things systematically in terms of the role that everybody will play and how we do things. So incremental progress, determine what the outcome is going to be, start with your vision and work backwards and figure out what that next step has to be. Thanks. Maybe a topic for discussion later, but, but uh, given our stuck 
innovation space has been in Canada, I'd argue that we're not even talking about innovation in some respects, we're talking about modernization. Um, and where the one crosses over into the other is, uh, is a point of discussion. Um, um, Dermot, so um, you're on record of saying that uh, academia equals data. Within um, the, um, an era where uh, paradigms like precision medicine and virtual medicine present huge disruptive opportunities, what, what is the role of a university or an academic health science organization with respect to those new paradigms? Um, how does um, the, that, that type of construct capture the value of, uh, of data, given that at the end of the day, a university really embodies knowledge, and knowledge is defined by data? Thank you very much, Alan. And it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, I, I'll go back to the last slide you showed, which was the Institute of Medicine's virtual learning environment as the construct that we should think about in terms of how we progress with uh, an academic health science centre and how we progress to uh, potentially disrupt the system. And really from the perspective of that virtual learning environment, the three outputs are uh, new knowledge, uh, improvements in health, that is new knowledge that produces improvements in health, and the third component is uh, the, the boost that such improvements give to the economy. Now, Let's face it, the third is only going to be possible if we are competitive. I think the basic principle that if we go ahead and do things as we always have done um, is not something that we can sustain into the future. There's a, a very nice editorial in, in the Harvard Business Review, and I brought this along as my prop, which is the new rules of competition. This is Harvard Business Review, uh, I think it's September, October. Three, three uh, headings underneath. Be paranoid. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, uh, develop a psych psychotic disease. What, what they actually mean is be aware. It's being done better somewhere else. It's being done in Asia. It's being done in, 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 a, in a different healthcare environment. Uh, we've heard about some of the, the innovation in, 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 in US healthcare. So we have, we have competition out there, and we have to get ahead of that competition. The second line is disrupt yourself. Now, to me, the disruptive technology here, the, the disruptive step is integration of data. Uh, and and we, we've heard it time and time again, and, and in the four presentations we had preceding this session, we had T1 translation, and then we had translational steps that go all the way out to T4. What makes all of those work is data. What will make uh, David Granville's drug make it into faster clinical trials, maybe more effective clinical trials, is data. The, potential that David's drug might affect a subset of patients uh, who have a particular genetic polymorphism, that's, that's, that, that's, that's an important question. How do we find those patients? Data. <laughs> we, so the, the, the disruptive step here is data integration across the province. And data integration across the province means that whether we call something an academic health science center, which is focused on T1 or T2 translation, or an academic health science network or system, it means that Anton and his colleagues are contributing to that academic effort because their data is inputting into the broader scheme of things. And, and they are recognized as contributing to that academic effort, which is improving patient care ultimately and also improving the economy. So if I was going to make any big plea, it's join the dots. The technology is there. We need to do it. Uh, we need to uh, put our collective uh, uh, aspirations to work in a single, in a single venture rather than, rather than multiple, multiple different ventures. We, we need to think about uh, how we get to scale. Four and a half million in population, that scale. Uh, 500,000 is not scale. So, so let's think about how we use the technologies at, at our fingertips uh, at, at a level of scale. So, coming back to the, uh, the, the beginning of the theme, we have uh, the, the, the concepts of the populations that we aim to, uh, to, to, to treat, the concept of wellness, the concept of wellness versus illness and disease. And uh, effectively, 
uh, Shakespeare always he he always said uh, he, he always said everything best. You know, he he set out the seven ages of man with the infants mewling and puking in its nurse's arms, etc., going all the way to to uh, reverting back to childishness and in, in old age, etc. But uh, but uh, really, if we think about how disruptive technologies and virtual healthcare uh, can work. We've been thinking a lot about uh, how uh, we use uh, virtual healthcare in the aging population and uh, as assisted aging, etc. Uh, actually, the roots of most of the common diseases of aging are in uh, that infant mewling in, in their, the mother's arms, and in fact, in pregnancy, uh, epigenetic changes from the mother's diet or smoking. Uh, then the, the problems of adolescence. Now, adolescents, we know, they don't listen to, to, to their parents, do they? You know, we've, they, they, uh, we, we're, we're idiots. Uh, adolescents and young adults, uh, they, they, they listen to what they learn on the internet uh, far more than they listen to their parents. For those couple of years when they grunt at you and say nothing to you and eventually emerge as, as fully-fledged adults. Uh, we, we have to think very strongly about uh, the, the importance of, of how we address health, health issues at that stage as part of our process towards wellness uh, in, uh, at, a, at an older age uh, because you know, smoking, diet, uh, risky behavior, sexual health, etc. all come into play. So I just c conclude by saying I don't believe that research is an, opt an optional extra in, in a, a learning health environment. Research is essential to the learning health environment. What gets measured gets done. So we need to, if we're going to change the way we implement health, we need to measure it, we need to record it, we need to practice excellent medicine so that the patients that we're entering into, uh, that, that, that are, 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 have their data recorded, have it act accurately recorded so that we can use that data to phenotype and genotype the patients that will lead to David's uh, successful clinical trials and produce uh, new drugs, new ther therapies, and new approaches to, uh, uh, to medicine. Lastly, do I have one sure. minute? Uh, the, uh, today in uh, The Guardian, there's an ed editorial by my uh, uh, colleague in London, uh, Lord Aradarzi, on the importance of words. Now, actually, it's just, it's well worth reading. Uh, have a look at it. The importance of words. Changing the words on a kidney donor card in the U UK increased uh, recruitment by 100,000. 100,000 lives potentially saved by changing words. Changing the words in which you uh, coordinate your practice and in which you invite your patients back to, to, uh, to uh, communicate with you uh, will improve the, uh, the, the take up and will improve their health significantly. As we're looking at the virtual world that Brendan is, is referring to, it's a real opportunity to test some of these paradigms, to think about how we construct, in very simple terms, uh, the approaches to patient care uh, within the new St. Paul's and the Providence uh, uh, setup, to think about how we do this in a very careful way so that we ensure uh, the, the, the health of, our, of the, the patients and the populations that we treat. Thank you. Thanks, David. And, and uh, Brendan, my last uh, question to you. We've heard about the, uh, one of the co conclusions of the report on innovation was um, uh, examining the role of industry as an economic uh, driver and innovation catalyst. Can you speak briefly, because we're running out of time very quickly, but can you speak briefly to the challenges of being a catalyst within a large um, corporation? What is the unique role of an innovation officer within that kind of context, and what are, the, what are the special challenges that you face within a large organization, let alone making change outside of that organization? Um, given that I'm two months in, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that we have to, to step back and, and, and look at is, uh, is actually the role of industry in in in, in healthcare. Um, you know, all, all told, private and public, we spend about 27 billion dollars in health in this province. Uh, we don't necessarily think about that as an investment in terms of economic driver uh, for entrepreneurial activity for innovation. Um, 
I was at a, a conference where, you know, a startup conference with digital health where all the companies there are marketing their solutions into the United States because there's no point to, to get into the system here. Um, you look at the procurement that we go through, you know, tell us uh, the procurement system's broken. Um, you, you actually, you know, there's a joke right now that you don't, you, you really don't want to finish second in a procurement because that means you probably spend a million or a million and a half dollars. Um, you, you want to finish third because the first guy will screw it up, the second guy, everyone got fired, and then you'll, you'll get the, the bid. <laughs> it's, it's that, it's that, it really is that bad, um, you know. And, and so, so we, we don't have easy ways to, to, you know, to get the, you know, the, the entrepreneurs or industry involved to solve these problems because there's a lot of concern with, with, with procurement. Um, you know, I think we have to start to carve out and think about our $27 billion investment that's going to health regardless. So if we don't do anything, we'll still spend that and more. Um, I think we have to start looking at that as being, you know, that's a, you know, as a, if you're looking at that as a business person, you know, f figuring out and taking a, a few percent here or there to try different things uh, really makes sense. Um, and, you know, technology is not the problem now. Um, you know, we've got a convergence of multiple, you know, truly exponential technologies uh, that, that are coming upon us. You know, everything from, you know, genomics and, and the whole omics stack where we'll have a molecular understanding of individuals through sensors. Uh, through deep learning systems, you know, that can actually, with, with a radiologist, improve detection of tumors on, on, on scans. Um, there's all of that, but it's going to run into some static forces that are not moving quickly. Uh, you know, the first is complexity and standards. Um, we're going to, we have to wrap our heads around that to get it to interoperability. And, and it's not very sexy, it's not very fun. Uh, but we, I think we can solve that one. The, the second one is, is the regulatory environment, the rules. Um, you know, when you look at virtual care, the reason we're not talking about virtual care, let's be honest, are, is the rules, right? As a practicing doctor, I can't actually use these tools. Anton said, there, it's not that the tools don't exist. It's not that I can't protect the privacy and security of, of you know, my patients' communications. It's the rules. Um, so we have, to, we have to just get our heads around that. And then the, the last piece is culturally. You know, culturally, there are too many entrenched interests that are happy enough and you know, satisfied enough in our system. You, you look at what happens in the developing world, they bypass all sorts of things. You know, they don't build landlines, they go right to cell phones. They don't build massive hospital structures, uh, they're building different things. Um, entrenched interests in, 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 in our space you know, it holds back the, the development. So we have to look at that and, and, and look at our own roles that we're playing in, in, in each one of those, those three things that are not moving so quickly. Thanks, Bruno. Paul, do we have time for questions? Sorry. Please. How, how many moments do we have? Huh? Why don't you go ahead and take uh, whatever the questions are, and okay. I'll try and just. Okay, thanks. Neil? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment uh, in support of uh, Brendan on the subject of procurement. And uh, I was, uh, prior to the federal panel, I was involved in an Ontario uh, Health Innovation Panel uh, where we identified that procurement was one of the key barriers to innovation in the province of Ontario. And, uh, you know, just, just to spell this out a little bit more, uh, Canada spends 3% of the $220 billion uh, a year on medical technology. And that uh, percent actually has been dwindling. Uh, we now rank with Turkey. Uh, you know, as about 60th in the world on what we spend in this area. Um, now, good procurement should uh, provide more cost-effective access to things, but the challenge is that uh, the approach has been very much to focus on individual items, you know, like I would like two billion uh, gauzes or something like this, instead of really looking at what's the problem and what's the solution. And for a long period of time, the European Union has had a process that they developed which is fair and transparent, uh, uh, which, which is called the competitive dialogue. And uh, that's something that we found in Ontario that was, that was missing in the guidance of the procurement officials. So uh, based on the OHIC report, which we filed uh, last December, and the, uh, the appointment of a key Ontario health innovation strategist, they are now implementing uh, a, a innovation procurement and so individual hospitals are stating their problems, asking for suppliers to identify solutions, 
which can include not just the products, but the entire process of the way they do different kinds of care. And so, uh, you know, we're bringing this, this to, uh, to Ontario, but I would suggest even in BC, some of this has gone on that we're aware of. I know the HSS BC uh, group has been out speaking about their uh, home dialysis program, uh, and, and they, they employed a similar uh, process. So it, it's there, we're just not using it. Neil, Neil if, is there any mechanism in the Ontario context of tracking unmet need to offset the privacy and the procurement uh, mindset? Um, the, the, uh, it, it's, it's really in the construct of the way you do the, the RFI, uh, you know, that, that you do uh, protect uh, patients' privacy. I'm not sure if that's what you're specifically referring to, but also, um, you know, uh, what, what they do is they go to market and they request, uh, you know, proposals and it's open to everybody, all the information is public domain. And then they choose the proponents that best match their needs, and that's when it goes into more a private dialogue. So that way, the individual proponents are protected. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Ferguson. I'm the CEO of Yogo, one of those companies that Brendan was talking about that's having a much easier time flying our people all over the United States doing business than doing business here in Vancouver. It's just too expensive to do business in the healthcare system in Canada. Um, but I want to talk about uh, something else. I just wanted to take a moment to advocate for and maybe hear your thoughts on the importance of um, helping patients help themselves. I mean, there's been a lot of really excellent talk here about getting much better at doing things for, some might say to, uh, patients. Um, helping patients do things for themselves seems like it would be critically important. We haven't really, I haven't really heard very much about it yet uh, today. Um, and just an observation of my own that it seems that the healthcare system in general, in the US as well as in Canada, is just catastrophically poor at building applications that patients want to use, can use, and want to use, choose to use, to help themselves. So maybe we can just talk a little bit, I'd be interested in hearing the panel's thoughts on, well, how do we do that better? <laughs> Emery? My, my, um, my personal bias is in the area of prevention. I think if you can keep people out of the system, you can actually um, reduce your costs and improve the system generally. There has been tremendous uh, research done with respect to um, optimizing longevity through the uh, effective application of exercise. The, actually, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, their Faculty of Medicine, won a Nobel Prize for some work that originated out of the Hunt database, which is probably the world's largest epidemiological database, over 120,000 people that were studied over 20 years, which included data on heart rate, blood pressure, all sorts of information. But what was really interesting that emerged from that study, because it was 20 years long, they had people that died. And they were able to correlate levels of activity with mortality, first time it was ever really done. And from that, they were able to derive a set of complex algorithms, seriously big data analytics, where they could prescribe, based on an individual's physiology, the exact amount of exercise they needed on a daily basis to live 10 years longer. And that's been clinically validated. It's soon to be published in some major journals, but this is new medicine that's just come out, and it's exciting because if you can actually enable a physician to engage in a conversation with a, with a patient and say, here, here's a tool that can actually, if you just do this on a daily basis, X number of minutes at X number of heartbeats per minute, then you will maximize your life. And it's a very simple way to reduce healthcare costs that's very low tech. And I can absolutely verify that from, from my own experience. I mean, that, that, that motivator and that power in the hands of patients is absolutely critical. Anne-Marie, you had um, a comment? Uh, yeah, that's probably uh, the biggest part of uh, my role is um, working out ways that we can help our heart, chronic heart failure patients help themselves. Um, uh, I'm just sort of smiling to myself because 10 years ago now, Scott Lear, uh, who uh, runs the BC... Um, Center for Telehealth uh, Policy and Research, um, and myself created a little web-based application that is totally focused on supervised self-management. So self-management for a, a chronically ill patient is not a one-hour talk and then on your way with a couple of handouts. It's an ongoing iterative process that, that just requires little short bursts of um, doing something and getting feedback, positive or negative, about how it 
work. So we created this little website for, on, on a shoestring, uh, and we actually did a privacy impact assessment. Uh, we, it's fully integrated into our clinical system. We did a feasibility and safety study to start, and we've now opened it up to uh, all the health authorities and said, here, we have this little uh, application for heart failure patients. It's great. Patients love it. Uh, it gives feedback to the nurses and the doctors about how they're doing, and it's free. Here, you can have it. The privacy impact assessment's done. No one wants it. Yet, I just heard we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on an expensive system uh, that puts something in the patient's home, a scale and, and stuff, which breaks down and people spill cups of tea on it and <laughs> stuff like that. And someone has to set it up in an elderly person's home. And here we are with this free little website uh, that people can use for free. And for some reason, people are scared of it if it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the bottom line is we've been using it clinically for many years and it's, it's great for patient self-management. It's got tools they can download, it gives them immediate feedback and that's what they need is feedback and then someone, uh, whoever that may be, sometimes I say it just needs to be a big sister or, or someone who, who can help them sort it all out. Um, and from that has uh, grown Scott Lear's doing a study that's looking at all sorts of chronic diseases with a similar sort of platform, supervised self-management. Um, and uh, that to me is the future that patients can just uh, log in, see how they're doing, get feedback from a professional, and uh, that, that is sorely lacking. Sure, and I'm going to shut off the discussion about this topic, off to you. Um, so, Michael, first of all, it's always great to see you back in our community. Um, so I think that what's often missing um, in these things is that we're not actually building context for the patient around this, right? So, Anne-Marie, your comment, I think, is spot on um, around that. So, you know, I happen to be one of those early adopters with my Apple Watch, and it's spectacular and things. Yeah, but it's not easy to use, and so, you know, putting something like this in the hands of an elder, elderly patient, for example, that's not a solution. The technology is never the solution. The best technology is utterly invisible to you. You're using technologies every day. Right now, you're sitting, you're surrounded by technology. Your eyeglasses, your pens, those things are absolutely invisible to you. We think about technology as things like the Apple Watch. That's, that's not what patients desire, right? They actually need a context for it. So I'll use virtual medicine as the example because that's what this panel is about. It's like, you know, in virtual medicine, um, you know, Mr. Jones, uh, virtual medicine is the, no, is the new way that we actually do a, a home visit for you, right? This is, this is us coming to your farmhouse um, in the middle of the night when you need to see us. That is patient context for, uh, for, these, for these tools, right? Technology is always just a tool, always. Um, it's not the solution, and um, adoption is really dependent upon creating and setting a context for your patients in terms of how they're going to interact with that. You, it needs to be a bit of an invitation. Um, and if you can put a community piece into it, um, you, as, as you know, I think you were talking about, Anne-Marie, you'll also see a much, uh, you know, much more engagement, right? The grandkids can set up the technology. Yeah. Um, or whatever it happens to be, and they're the ones that will actually provide the support for use and behavioral change and those kinds of things. So thank you, Ellen. Thanks so much. Diane, last, uh, last question. Okay, and I'll be okay if you don't answer it because we're running out of time, but happy to pose the question. So at the last panel, the, when we were talking about researchers and how we select what we do and how do we incentivize the collaboration and integration that we need, um, you know, we talked about it at that level. But with this panel, now the question becomes how do we go up a level in the system to organizations and sectors, right? So we've got a range of organizational representatives and sector representatives on this panel. And the question is how do we incentivize our working together? Because we need to work together as researchers with different disciplines, but we also need to work together as organizations if if health care, in a sense, and is going to improve across the board. Because we need each other, we have different sorts of expertise, um, and we need to learn from each other how to answer those complex questions and work at different parts of the system. Dermot, can, can I ask you to take that one? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, I, I, I guess uh, the, uh, the uh, issue is that we have academic institutions health authorities, hospitals, rural health practices, etc., uh, all of whom play a, a significant part in the delivery of health care, and all of whom can play a, a substantial part 
in the enhanced delivery of health care uh, as we go into the future and also uh, can play a significant part in the, the knowledge economy. And so uh, effectively, I think we need to have a, a forum that brings our, our partners in healthcare, in, in the academic world, and in the business world together in, in a way that uh, allows us to uh, extend this dialogue uh, to, to, to look at what are, the, uh, what are the factors that are missing within the environment to, to make things happen. So I've been really struck since I came here uh, by the uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I think you, you've seen it in this room this morning, the, 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 the questioning about new ways of doing things, the, the, the uh, entrepreneurial approach to developing new drugs, new technologies, uh, new approaches to science. Uh, to, to really uh, drive uh, BC forward, uh, then, then the question becomes, how do we attract uh, the best? So I take come back to the, uh, to the last line which I missed, and thank you, Diane, for giving me the option on, the, on this front page, because it says, go to war for talent. So from an academic perspective, we have to go to war for talent. We have to bring the, the best people that we, we have in, uh, that we can into the, into the mix. As, as part of this continuum, and as part of this partnership, and secondly, I think that the other piece of talent that we need to bring in is the talent in the business world, in the startup world. Go, go down south, uh, down, down, down the coast uh, to San Diego, San Francisco, the Bay Area. Uh, you've got startup companies rising and falling, rising and falling. Uh, and the characteristic there is that there is a, a pool of, of that talent, that startup capability talent, and you've also got the, 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 the pharma sector investing in what, what happens in, in that space. So I think for us, the dialogue is between all of us here in this room today. Uh, how do we sustain that dialogue? How do we build it? Uh, do, do we create an organization that, that is a partnership organization between the business, uh, academic, and health worlds? Uh, how do we use uh, our, our collective energies uh, to bring new resources into the system, new venture capital money, uh, and, uh, and to attract uh, research-based industry here, for example? Uh, these, these are questions I think we need to ask. Um, I don't, I, the, what we did in, in London was to create a company between the three academic medical centres in London called uh, MedCity. And MedCity is actually really proving its worth in, uh, in, in raising the profile of London as a health, health science knowledge economy, which it ironically didn't have before. It had a, a profile as an excellent health research uh, environment, but not as a health-based knowledge economy. And we can think of uh, constructive ways of doing that that sort of thing, but that's the, that's, we need to raise the profile, uh, we need to uh, create a, an external perception of the energy that is in the system, and uh, we need to attract uh, people into the system. Brendan. Yeah, just, I just want to add one, one comment to that, because I completely concur. Um, so I had an opportunity to, in January to go with Paul Drone and the Life Sciences BC uh, group to, to the UK. And, and you, you know, you, you go there and you're struck by the depth of research that's coming, you know, coming out of the, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, London. And, and you look and you say, well, we, you know, we don't have, we've got good research, we don't have that depth. You go down to San Diego, you go down to the Bay Area, and you're, 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 you're awestruck by how big they think, the, the dollars that are flowing in, and you go, you know, we, we don't have that. But you come back here, and, and this is the conclusion of a, a, a number of us, you come back here, we, ha we have some tremendous assets here. Um, but we're not going to have the dollars, we're not going to have all that research, so we have to collaborate better than anyone else in the world if we want to compete. We have to take our strengths. We have, we, you know, we have a single medical school in the province, that, so we don't have competition there. There's, there's no kind of rival factions there. The cancer agency and, and what it's able to achieve, um, you know, the physicians of BC, the, 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 you know, the, the health authority structure, we've got a lot of assets there. We've got a lot of data that's, that's you know, been here for, you know, a number of years. Um, we've, got, we've got institutions, uh, we've got, you know, life sciences companies, um, we've got startup energy. Um, but unless we actually pull all that together, like that's got, that's got to be our competitive advantage because we won't win it on the other factors. Um, when we left the UK, a number of us kind of commented that, and in, in, you, know, you could probably validate this, you know, with, with all that talent, 
there was a lot of issue still in terms of collaborating. Collaboration's not easy. Um, the US model set up quite differently for collaboration. It's not about collaboration. So I, I think that, that would be my plea here is, is you know what, Let, let's, let's all kind of get, get in a room together and, and continue to work these things through. I think not being able to end a session is a really good sign, Bob. I apologize. Shauna, last comment. I just, I just wanted to say one thing, and that is that um, I, think, I think that the most important thing for us to do, I don't know where, Diane, I don't know where you are, but um, there you are. The most important thing for us to do, I think, is not to think about how we're going to spend our piece of the pie, but how do we actually create a bigger pie? That is our job, and that should be first and foremost. So to what Brendan has said, to what Dermot has said today, um, that creates a spirit of collaboration, right? We need to support each other, create wins for each other. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time working in the Valley until very, in the Silicon Valley until very recently. And the first thing that we ask each other when just after we meet and tell, you know, give each other a context for what we're doing and who we are is, how can I help you? How can I help you? And I think that that needs to become our mantra. How can I help you? How can I build you up? How can I create success? How do we work together to do that? And I think that if we can do that, we can make change. And by next year at this time, we'll be having a very different conversation because we'll be looking back at a number of successes. I think it's an excellent note on which to end this uh, panel discussion. Um, I'd want to, I want to thank the, uh, the panel, panelists very much for participating, thank the audience as well. I'd ask you to remember to keep your questions and your comments for the, the breakout session so we can actually really attempt to get to value by the end of this, uh, uh, of this, of this day.